it is Wednesday, June 9th, already. Goodness gracious, June is starting to fly by as fast as anything else that we've experienced so far uh, this year. We are excited uh, to have uh, a full, if you will, calendar of events taking place for us uh, this, uh, this summer. Starting Sunday, reminder, we are going back to our traditional times of worship, our 9 o'clock contemporary service in the Fellowship Hall, and our 11 o'clock traditional service in the sanctuary. Hope that you'll be able to attend one of those services and would invite you to please stay after the 9 o'clock or come early to the 11 o'clock and join us for perhaps a cup of coffee and a pastry. If the weather permits, we'll be out in the, in the curve by the uh, front of the education building. If not, we'll have it just inside there on the breezeway and, and uh, in the area of the education building around the library. So either way, hope that you can come and join us for a cup of coffee and a uh, uh, pastry and just kind of uh, mingle a little bit, get to see each other for the first time in a while. I'm looking forward to um, trying to you know, recover some of, of what we have been able to do and in, invigorating with new ideas as well. So I hope that you will remember that for this particular Sunday, starting this Sunday, June 13th. I want to thank Dr. Roy Ford filling in for me last Sunday, and I appreciate that very, very much. We had a great time and a great uh, a weekend for the wedding for Eric Catherine Hall, and uh, uh, it was beautiful venue, and just, uh, uh, it's, it's great. I have had some, you know, the weddings, despite COVID, we've had uh, three or four weddings, and uh, this was the first one that really kind of felt normal. Uh, Joel and Lauren's wedding, Lauren Wright's wedding, a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, uh, felt a little bit more normal. Of course, I remember back a year ago, um, over a year ago, Allison and Dylan Pace, and uh, they really did everything they could to to make sure everyone was safe, and they trimmed things down just in order for uh, us to have a wonderful time and celebration of wedding that so it's it's great it, it is great to be able to do that and to provide uh, a chance of celebration uh, in the midst of such a wonderful time and occasion we are going to continue our study uh, before we do I, I remember I started a few weeks ago trying to give you an idea of what are some of these things behind us well this is the first thing I picked up for today it is this, and if you're from here, you ought to recognize this is a um, basically a plastic version of the Ridgeway clock. Uh, of course, this is a, a, a copy of the famed Ridgeway clock um, that's given to the winner in Martinsville twice a year in NASCAR, and this is, was a commemorative piece. Uh, it was um, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s fall 2014 uh, final run and, and tour through NASCAR, if you will, and received that at the racetrack when I did the prayer there. So, uh, you know, got that hanging or sitting over here on the uh, the office. Lots of stories to tell on those things sometime. Well, I have the privilege of continuing to look with us in our study from promise to exile. And we are starting to get into the portion where a lot of people get bogged down with all of the kings and all their names and how did we go from Israel to Judah to Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera. So just very briefly, let me remind you where we left and, and covered last week. We finished up with David's story and Solomon's story. And then along comes Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam... Uh, did not set well. Uh, friction had already begun to happen. It was happening uh, within the kingdoms. And so basically, in a simplistic way to tell you, the northern tribes, which were ten kingdoms, or ten families, tribes of Israel, broke away to form their own nation, and they kept the name Israel. While uh, Jerusalem and the southern tribe, Judah, remained their own entity, their own people, their own nation, if you will, and they, they were known as Judah, but most everyone found it synonymous Judah and Jerusalem. 
Uh, and it was a lot of it had to do with the the way David and then Solomon and then Rehoboam had set things up for Jerusalem to be the prime place and the prime city. So it led to a lot of um, rivalry, friction, envy, if you will. And so the, the countries ha have formed into two nations along the way. Um, and when last we spoke, uh, we were actually getting to one of the more interesting parts and kings, if you will. Um, Israel, uh, that's the northern kingdom. Remember, Israel's the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is Judah. In Israel, they had a king who followed by the name of Abijam. And Abijam was only the king for three years. Some of these guys ruled a long time. Some didn't rule very long at all natural reasons and others, kind of like uh, Rome's history in that respect, too. Um, but Abijam had a problem. He was, according to the kings, to the writers of kings, the history in, in 1 Kings 14, that uh, uh, he, was, he was not true to the Lord, we were told, like the heart of David was. And so he granted uh, you know, the favor of succession to Asa, A-S-A, uh, who was in Judah. And Judah did some good things and did some not so good things. He, he performed reforms in the area. He began to, to, um, to get rid of some of the foreign influence of the false gods. He banished male prostitutes in the region and idols uh, from the temple and removed the uh, foreign queen mother, Macha, because she had made an image of her false god, Asherah. And uh, the reform went well, but was kind of incomplete. It kind of just settled into Jerusalem. It didn't go much farther than that. Um, then Asa, who was king of Judah, and then Basha, who became king of, of Israel, began to get together, and they began um, to um, uh, have the friction with each other. Over the course of time, Judah and Israel will fight. Uh, some battles and wars with each other, and then other times they will unite to form an alliance or a confederation against an enemy. But perhaps the most interesting kingly character uh, of the kings is a guy who um, shows up in Israel whose name is Ahab. Ahab ruled from 874 to 853, uh, BC and uh, he he is a guy who's who's known to us not just because of what he does but because God raises a prophet who will become the prophet in the history of Israel and his name is Elijah and Ahab becomes king after a couple of coups uh, and everything, and then Ahab's reign begins, and with his reign, he, he contracts a political marriage, which is what happened to royalty a lot of times back then. Even David, even David, who was married to Saul's daughter, Michal, was, was married to her only out of expediency, trying to keep... Uh, the house of Saul and the house of David somewhat on the same page with each other. Um, so it was one of you know, expediency. This lady's name is probably even more well known than King Ahab. Her name is Jezebel. Yeah, that's right. Even became uh, kind of an adjective to describe people who uh, were just hideous. Uh, you Jezebel. And that's where that comes from. Ahab marries Jezebel. She is the daughter of Ethbal, who is the king of Sidon. And Sidon was a tremendous center for the worship of Baal. Now, you've heard it pronounced either way, Baal or Baal, B-A-A-L. And um, it is there that she basically builds an altar to Baal. And she built it in Samaria, where Ahab was king, which... Uh, went under the rule of his lands. They just acquired it not long before. Uh, and they even made a sacred pole to Asherah um, that uh, was a consort of Baal. And so Elijah is raised up by God to speak out. 
He's a Tishabite from Gilead. Now, I doesn't tell you a whole lot. You have to look that up, I suppose. But, but he comes with a message for Ahab. But he has to get there. The first message he gives them is that they are, um, you know, he's come to bring them back to Yahweh and back to God. Um, we talked last week for a moment, I think, about uh, the miracle of the oil and the flour and the widow of Zarephath and how Elijah provides for them. There had been a huge drought that was predicted by God through Elijah. And so he, um, you know, there's a great story there that we talked about last week. And then Elijah comes and he sends word. He wants to square off with the prophets of Baal. Showdown. Gunfight at the OK Corral. Gary Cooper high neck. You know, however you want to imagine it. You know, Val Kilmer as, as Doc Holliday in Tombstone. Uh, you know, here comes Elijah. And he says, I'm by myself, but I'm, I'm going to take on all the prophets of Baal. We're going to decide who's God is really God. Now, you've probably heard the story before or you're familiar to some of it, but sometimes my friend Beekner ends up uh, writing it with such descriptive prose that I, I, I feel like I go back to him to give us a, a an ex, more exciting taste of the story, if you will. So this was his take on this showdown. In the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal to see whose God was the real article. Elijah won the first round, hands down. He started out early in the morning on Mount Carmel, which is kind of like a ridge, by the way, more than a mountain. And the prophets of Baal pulled out all the stops to get their candidate to set fire to the sacrificial offering they'd made. They danced around the altar till their feet were bloody and sore. They made themselves hoarse, shouting instructions and encouragement at the sky. They jabbed at themselves with knives, thinking the sight of blood would start things moving, if nothing else would. But they might as well have saved themselves the trouble. Although it was like beating a dead horse, Elijah couldn't resist getting in a few digs. Maybe Baal's flown to Bermuda for the weekend and can't hear you, he said. Maybe your God's taking a nap. The prophets whipped themselves into greater and greater frenzies under his goading. But by mid-afternoon, and hours had gone by, the sacrificial offering had begun to smell a little high in the heat. And there was still no sign of fire from above. And now it was Elijah's turn to show all of them, including Israel, what Yahweh could do. He was like a magician getting ready to pull a rabbit out of a hat. First, he had a trench dug around the altar, which, by the way, the altar that Elijah builds is made of 12 stones. So what? There were 12 tribes of Israel, almost a dig from God through Elijah to the onlookers that God created you as one nation, not as two separate ones. But he dug a trench around the altar, filled it with water, then Elijah got a bucket brigade going to give the offering a good dowsing, too. Then as soon as they had finished, he got them to do it again just for good measure. And by the time they would finished a third go-around, the whole place was awash, and Elijah looked as if he just finished swimming the channel. He then gave Yahweh the word to show his stuff, and Elijah jumped back just in time. Lightning flash, the water in the trench fizzled like fat on a hot griddle, and nothing was left of the offering but a pile of ashes and a smell not unlike the 4th of July. The onlookers were beside themselves, and they were so enthusiastic at the signal from Elijah, they demolished the losing team down to the last prophet. Nobody could say whose victory had been greater, Yahweh's or Elijah's, along the way. Here is Elijah, God using the prophetic voice of Elijah and then God's own miraculous work to reveal Yahweh 
to all of them. And they can see that Baal is a false god. And they are so incensed that they have abandoned the true God, they kill the prophets of Baal. And you think that's a good way for the story to kind of end. And I kind of wished it had ended right there. But it didn't. You see, what happens next is that word gets back and Ahab isn't happy. But what's more, Jezebel is furious. In 2 Kings 19, we're told the story that Jezebel hears about the murder of all of her prophets, and she says, before the sun goes down, if I can get my hands on Elijah, I'll have his head on a spit. Elijah gets word. Now, this is for television, radio, and etc. So, but Elijah gets word of her threat and impending possible doom. This man who has been the vessel for God's power. And what does he do? Does he stand up to Jezebel? Stand up to Ahab? No. He is afraid. He values his head. He leaves. He doesn't just leave. The Bible says he flees. He gets out of town the fastest way he could get. And he, all this happens, if you can imagine the, the country of Israel. You know, I'll use my little thing here, uh, my little uh, Ridgeway clock. Uh, if this is the northern part of Israel and the way it shapes down, and the bottom part here is Judah, he goes from up here all the way down, passes, bypasses Judah, and gets down to the Sinai Desert over there. And on the way, he is getting there as fast as he can, fleeing on the fastest horse he could find. And we're told that along the way, he laid down. And he prayed under what was described as a solitary broom tree. His prayer was this. Now, remember what these guys just done. And his prayer was, I've had enough, Lord. You just began your career. You just won a great big showdown. I have had enough. And he prays to God, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who've already died. Wow. Top of the mark, <clears throat> bottom. So he laid down and he slept under the broom tree, and as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, I want you to get up and eat. So Elijah looked around him, and he found food. God, God's angels had prepared. So he ate. And he drank some water that was waiting for him. And then the angel comes back and says, do it again. Eat some more, rest some more drink a little more. So he does that. And it was enough to help him travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. Now remember what Sinai is. Sinai is the mountain of God. This is where <coughs> God gave Moses the commandments. It's where the presence of God spoke and called Moses out of a burning bush that was not consumed. It, it is the original dwelling place, if you will, that we think of, of God, of Yahweh. It's when God tells Moses, you know, my name is I am, Yahweh. And it sticks. Elijah is now there. And he goes into a cave and he spends the night. Then he hears a voice. The Lord said to him, according to, again, 1 Kings 19, What are you doing here, Elijah? And his words are, are what is so interesting. He says, I have zealously served you, Lord, the Lord God Almighty. I've served you. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They tore down your altars. They killed every one of your prophets. And I, I alone am the only one who is left. Oh, pity me. Pity me, Lord. 
why don't you just, don't you realize now they want to kill me too? Now, this is the guy who not long before said, God, kill me. And now he's saying, well, don't kill me, but, you know, woe is me. I'm so, I have it so bad. So God says, okay, go out of the mouth of the cave, which is high up in the mountain, and stand and look out. And he does that, and he's basically standing there, and God has these things happen. There's a windstorm, a rushing wind, a, uh, a, a massive wind, which, by the way, wind in the symbolism of Scripture, particularly Hebrew and uh, you know the New Testament as well, the word for the Spirit of God is the same as the Hebrew word for wind. It is the word ruach. Try saying that a lot. Ruach. And the ruach of God goes blowing by. And you think that, you know, that's God's presence. But no, no, God wasn't in that wind. And then fire comes from out of nowhere. But God wasn't in the fire. And there was an earthquake. Things were shaking, but God wasn't in there. All of these are spectacular things that are taking place. And then everything was quiet. And not only was nature quiet, Elijah was quiet. He'd stop speaking. And suddenly... A gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped, we're told, his face in his cloak and stood there at the entrance. And the voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he goes through the pity me's again. And God said, I want you to go back the way you came. And I want you to get to Damascus. And I want you to anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. And I want you to know that I have preserved at least 7,000 others who believe me like you do. You're not alone. Now, if you were to look at this story in the 19th chapter of uh, Kings, verse Kings, you would clinically probably be able to recognize that Elijah is a man of extreme ups and downs. He is um, either way up or, or he's way down. And in this case, he is depressed. Any good clinician will tell you that you don't, you know, when you are depressed, you need to rest. When you are depressed, you need to eat. When you are depressed, you, it, it helps and pays to just be still for a while. Um, and to relax for a while. That's how important it is. And ironically, it's probably the last thing we do. It's the last thing Elijah does. He allows him to get himself get worked into a deep, dark hole. And then these things happen. God provides all the way. Even though he's fleeing from Jezebel, even though he's scared to death, even though he's got the pity me's, nobody's got it hard like I've got it, Lord. No, no matter that he's kind of quasi-suicidal to some extent, which is funny because he's, He's fleeing because he's afraid he'll lose his life, but he <laughs> begs God to take it. So, yeah, up and down. And yet, in the middle of all this, God speaks quietly to him, patiently with him, provides what God knows he needs, because God was not yet, Yahweh was not yet done with him. There was more to still be done. And he needed to do that. And so the result is that uh, uh, he's given a new command, a new job, if you will. Um, 
in the midst of the end of this, he's also given a helper. In the last part of the 19th chapter, Elijah went and he found a, a person by the name of Elisha. Always those two names are so close to each other, you wonder, couldn't you have found Dick, Bob, or Harry? You know, somebody who, whose name did not sound similar to his own, but he didn't. He, he, he found Elisha. And Elisha was the son of Shaphat and a plowing a field. He was a, he was a farmer. There were 12 teams of oxen, and Elisha was plowing, and Elijah went over to him, threw his cloak across his shoulders, and just walked away. And Elisha took it as a sign, and he ran after Elijah. And he says to him, look, let me go first, kiss my father goodbye, tell my mother goodbye, and I'll go with you. And Elijah said, okay, go on back, but think about what I've done to you. So Elisha returned to the ox, slaughtered them. <laughs> Stop plowing. He slaughtered them for the meat. Used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. Passed around the meat to the townspeople they all ate. And then he went and followed Elijah, kind of like an assistant, if you will. Now I bring his name up because he's going to have a lot of stories written about him. But Elijah's time is not, not through. And neither is Ahab's time. In the 21st chapter... Um, there is a story of a man by the name of Naboth. Naboth has the best vineyard in the kingdom. The wines he produces are impeccable. And the problem is, it's right near the palace of King Ahab. And Ahab wants that vineyard. He wants it now. And he pleads with Naboth. But Naboth says, no, I'm not selling. I'm not selling this. And so basically, long story short, Ahab decides that he is going to take care of Naboth. The old, um, how should I put it? The old uh, godfather kind of way, if you will. Um he is going to make up charges against Naboth. And Naboth is executed. Um, he trumps up these things, and Elijah hears about it. And so, basically, um, God tells Elijah what has happened. That Ahab wanted the vineyard, Jezebel worked on giving it by getting him killed, and God tells him everything that happened. So he tells Elijah, I want you to go meet King Ahab. He'll be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel and claiming it for himself, giving this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? You had to rob him too? Because you've done this, Dogs will lick your blood at the very place where they licked the blood of Naboth. And so my enemy, you have found me, Ahab exclaimed to Elijah. And Elijah said, yep. I've come because you've sold yourself to what is evil in God's sight. The Lord says I'm going to bring disaster to consume you and destroy everything you have and are. As far as Jezebel, he says, God told him the dogs will eat Jezebel's body at the plot of land in Jezreel. And even the members of Ahab's family will be eaten by the dogs along the way. Wow. Quite a pronouncement. And precisely, this is kind of what plays out. Ahab ends up going to war. Now, Ahab, despite his wickedness, had been, according to the scriptures, given a couple of major victories by God, but he never did acknowledge God as part of it. He instead basked in the glory of what his armies had accomplished with him at the head of them. Um, he just forgot about God altogether. And then he's killed in battle, in a battle at Ramon Gilead with the Arameans, as he's in um, in concert, in an alliance with Judah, the brothers from the south, to take this land back. And it's a terrible, miserable 
military failure. And Ahab is killed there. And Jezebel, I'm going to get back to her in just a second. Um, but it should be right in here. Um, and sure enough, all the things that have been said and predicted for him happens to Ahab. Um, and it ends up that Jezebel is killed. And she ends up, um, you know, it's one of those things I'm trying to get to my note there. Um, you know, she ends up um, being eaten by the dogs along the way. Once more, we, we take a look at Ahab's life from the lens of a, an author. And I, I, I kind of always like this because Elijah was such a thorn in the side of Ahab. Whereas just about everybody has a cross to bear, King Ahab had two of them. One of the crosses was the prophet Elijah. If, generally speaking, a prophet to a king was like ants at a picnic, Elijah was more like a swarm of bees. The other cross was his foreign-born wife, Jezebel, who had gotten religion in a big way back in the old country and was forever trying to palm it off on the Israelites, who had perfectly good religion of their own. But unfortunately for Ahab, the two of them sometimes got to working on him at the same time, one from one side, the other from the other, and a case in point was that Naboth affair. To make a sordid story short, Naboth had a vineyard that Ahab wanted so much he could taste it, and when Naboth refused either to sell or to swap, Ahab went into a sulk. He laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face, and he would eat no food. Which is kind of ironic. It sounds a little bit like Elijah on the other end of, of the, the planet in Sinai. But it was the kind of opening that Jezebel was always on the lookout for to help her boy. Was he a king or a cup custard? She asked him, and she proceeded to take charge. Found guilty of a trumped-up charge, Naboth got stoned to death. Ahab got the vineyard and, needless to say, got a visit from Elijah. Down through the years, they'd kept meeting like that, usually in secluded places, always at critical moments. Ahab would arrive incognito, in the dark glasses, the Panama hat, the business suit, Elijah with a 10-day growth of beard. Ahab addressed him in his usual informal way as a royal pain in the neck, and then Elijah would let him have it with both barrels. When God got through with him, Elijah said there wouldn't be enough left of Ahab to scrape off the sidewalk, and what there was, the dogs would take care of. As for Jezebel, not only because of Naboth, but because of all of her imported witch doctors and totem poles, she would end up the same way. Ahab at least said he was sorry, and as a result was allowed to die honorably in battle. Part about the dogs coming true only in the sense they got to lap the water up that his bloody chariot was hosed off with afterwards. Jezebel, on the other hand, continued unrepentant to the end, and when the end finally came, they threw her out of the window. And when the dogs got finished, all that was left for the undertaker was the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. <laughs> you know, these guys bring it upon themselves, and yet I, I find a lot of similarity in my life and in others in these people and not just always the good old prophets but also sometimes the 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 kings along the way elijah will continue to serve yahweh but it will never be quite the same powerful stories that we'd read already in second king or in first kings and by the time we get to second kings it is time for him to go in the second chapter there is this tremendous transition Elijah tells Elisha that it's time for him to go, and even prophets come up to see him off because God has told them it's time for him to go. And the result is that Elijah goes out ahead of Elisha. And as he's doing so, this tremendous whirlwind, fiery kind of whirlwind, comes and scoops up Elijah and takes him away into the heavens. 
That's right, Elijah doesn't really die. Kind of like Enoch in Genesis. He he goes and into the presence of God. As he's leaving, departing, his mantle, his cloak, his coat falls and lands upon Elisha. As Elisha picks up, and this is where we get the phrase, he, you know, he's picking up the mantle for so-and-so. It's this story. Elisha picks up the mantle of Elijah to take on that role of being a prophet for God. And Elisha will give us new stories of God at work with other kings and with other parts of the story. Uh, will give us new people to look at that we'll look at next week in 2 Kings. And some fascinating people, such as Naaman, the Syrian general. Uh, fascinating ways in which he handles kids who make fun of his bald head. I have to remember to talk about that one next week. And he is there to kind of get crises uh, resolved in the presence of God seen in the midst of it. Uh, and he journeys throughout Israel looking to be a voice for God and doing some interesting, miraculous things. Well, we want to stop there for this week, and we'll pick up with the story. A good place to stop right there as we say goodbye to Elijah, and we will say hello to Elisha next week. Uh, a few things that I'm aware of to bring before you in our prayer concerns. First of all, let me tell you how appreciative I am of the response of people who are going to help with Vacation Bible School, which is July 25th through the 30th. We, I sat down with Rhonda uh, Purvis, who is our uh, director, and we were able to fill out... Uh, the roles and responsibilities of those who have volunteered and we have plenty of help and I am grateful for that. So I hope that you'll get the word out to young people. I hope you get the word out to yourselves because we have an adult class that Pat Jones will be teaching and uh, hope that you will uh, uh, look at perhaps participating in that as well. Looking at our prayer concerns Remember Shirley Hyatt, as she will be having uh, the surgical procedure done for a defibrillator on the 14th, which is Monday. Please remember her in your prayers during this anxious time. Uh, be with, remember Carol McCraw. She is having tremendous trouble with her legs and battling cellulitis there. And uh, I think try a new round of um, antibiotics. Uh, remember her husband John who continues to battle Parkinson's uh, those who are recovering through rehab and so forth Smitty, Paulette Martin Dave Maddox recovering from their surgeries um, remember those under treatment Matt Fouts if things went well which I'm hoping they did in the meeting earlier this week that um, he'll begin to start the chemos this week the chemotherapy uh, Jimmy Wright, Don Shermer Charles Lewis, etc. Uh, remember Bill McDaniel who continues to have some tremendous uh, pain through here and his shoulder and, and elsewhere. Um, remember Jay Turner as he continues to wait and go through the procedures for a lung transplant through UVA. And his mother, Irene, and John, his father. Remember um, the family of Gladys Truel who passed away um, Monday morning, I believe it was, or maybe it was yesterday morning. Um, but uh, she will be laid to rest back here next to her, Curtis. Uh, those arrangements are still incomplete at the moment as far as I am aware. Uh, but we will let you know as soon as we can here on Facebook and on our website as well. Uh, but remember the family of Gladys Truel. I ask if you would now that you join with me uh, in a time and a season of prayer. Lord, our God, we come before you 
we realize that sometimes you come in the most fantastic of ways. Other times, you appear as a soft, still voice that speaks powerful, eternal words to us. We lift up before you all of these people that we have laid on our hearts or have spoken about or perhaps haven't yet mentioned. But Lord, we know that we all need a touch and a whisper of your voice. So speak to us now and touch us now where we need most to be healed. In the name of your Son, we offer our prayer and our lives. Amen. I'm looking forward to getting to see you on Sunday, either at 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock. And here, Facebook Live, streaming both, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Also in person, if you want to join us, 9 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, 11 o'clock in the Sanctuary. Looking forward to seeing you somewhere in worship on Sunday.